بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين Respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters, youngsters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah We welcome the holy month of Ramadan by developing the right mental framework of realizing the excellence and the merit of this holy month and how to respect its sanctity and how to fast not only from the physical restrictions but also from the spiritual prohibitions so our eyes and ears and tongue and limbs also have to be controlled in the state of fasting and beyond that of course our minds and hearts have to be guarded and purified and then we discussed about the importance of fasting not in any time of the year but specifically in the holy month of Ramadan and the specificity of the holy month of Ramadan was because the holy Quran was revealed in this month and then we looked into how we should therefore engage with the Quran so that it can enable us to be guided, to be awakened, to be enlightened, to be reformed. How to read the Qur'an in an active way, attentive way, interactive way, reformative, transformative manner. There are two approaches to the Qur'an. One is tafsir which is the deeper understanding, the commentary of the Qur'an, but based on scholastic and academic qualification. Ordinary people who are not trained will not be able to engage in the tafsir. In fact, if they do try, they will make mistakes and wrong interpretations. I will give certain examples, I will point out certain examples tonight. But what everyone is challenged to do, Muslim or non-Muslim, believer or non-believer, trained or untrained, is to be able to do tadabbur. فَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. This appears in Surah Nisa, and again in Surah by the name of the Prophet, Surah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa And in Surah Sa'd, chapter 38, Allah says, the reason why the Qur'an was sent down was لِيَدَّبَّرُوا So that they do تَدَبَّرُوا Nowhere in the Qur'an is it said that the Qur'an was sent down so that you do tafsir. Yes, tafsir is necessary, we will look into it. But what everybody is tasked with is to be able to do that book. So I'll give you examples of both enable, to enable us to better appreciate. And the fundamental difference between tafsir and tadabbur is that you don't need training for tadabbur, but you need training for tafsir. Tafsir is a deep science. There are multiple, 10, 20 different studies that have to be completed to be able then to qualify to do tafsir. And yes, tafsir enters into the depth, but what is sufficient to begin the process of guidance is tadabbur. Well, tafsir, for example, will require a person to check the hadith which explains the, the deeper meaning of this ayah. Now this hadith will have to be then scrutinized for its authenticity and for its reliability and credibility. We gave the example yesterday of uh, Prophet Nuh mentioned in many surahs in the Quran, 125 verses, but one whole surah devoted to him. 
So I want to give more examples of how we can do tadabbur on that surah. لَقَدْ كَانَ in Surah Mubarakah Yusuf after the completion of the story of Nabi Yusuf towards the end Allah says لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ Surely in the stories that we narrate be it of Yusuf or of other Anbiya there is definitely a moral lesson for everyone so that they can learn, ponder and change themselves in all aspects of their lives. So, uh, ayah number one, if you can uh, show of Surah Nuh. So, ayah number one to ayah number four introduces the task that was given to Nabi Nuh that he was sent to warn and he did the warning with three messages, ayah number two. The three messages were Allah, worship God and God alone, وَاتَّقُوهُ and be mindful and wary and conscious of God, taqwa. And number three, وَأَطِيعُونِ and obey me, the messenger of God. I had suggested, of course, there are several tafsir you can refer to, but one which is quite helpful, user-friendly, and which is compiled based on the popular mainstream sources of tafsir is the one that I introduced by the name of tafsir uh, Tadabbar al-Qur'an. In Juzu 29, Surah 71, is the discussion of um, Surah Nuh, alayhi salam. So I'm quoting an example. They're, they're showing us the authors have compiled and they, they have done a little reflection and they're sharing with us. So that will show us an example of how to do reflection. Then I will also share with you my, my points. And then you can take it up from there. So under these four verses, the authors are suggesting that the reflective learning point is what taqu. How do I apply this in my life? Nabi Nuh salam, has brought a message like all the other messages. The same message is repeated again and again in, for example, Surah Shu'ara, chapter 26, where again there's mention of Nabi Nuh and Ibrahim and uh, Salih and uh, Hud and Shu'aib and Lut salam. This common message is there. So this taqwa message is common. So these authors have suggested, why don't we reflect on taqwa and see how we can apply it to our lives. So they say, you know, there's an ayah in the Quran which says, إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُوا إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُوا اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Surely Allah will only accept and approve and therefore reward and bless those deeds that which we perform if they are associated with taqwa. If I do ibadah without taqwa, I don't care about the conditions, I don't prepare myself. I pray salah without the tahara, or the proper tahara, why I don't pray the proper time, why I don't pray in the proper way, no taqwa. Or no, I perform tasks which are haram. I have lent some, uh, sorry, I have borrowed some money from a lender. We agreed and I made a promise that during this time period, I will pay back to you after a few weeks, few months, few years. Time has come. The lender now contacts me and says, excuse me, we had agreed and you promised, time is up. Can you pay me back my money that you borrowed? But, you, and, but what you do is you take your phone and keep it towards the masjid and the azan is Allahu Akbar. And then you wait to say, Hayya ala salah. And you say, Labbaik Allahumma, I'm coming for salah. My brother, it is wajib first. If the time of salah is not going to lapse, it is wajib first to go and pay back the lender. So that's taqwa, for example. 
So these offers are suggesting, take this message of taqwa and see how we can apply it in our lives, of course, according to the rulings of the Sharia of the last prophet. This is a suggestion they have made. Allow me then to make three suggestions. So the three messages of Prophet Nuh is Allah, worship God and God alone. The message I learned from there for reflection is ikhlas. So I need to check my ibadah, my niyyah, where I perform, how I perform, what is my state of mind, do I have ikhlas or not. Second, of course, is taqwa. Third, the ayah says, what me and obey me. So in addition to practicing taqwa, we have to take the Prophet and after him the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt and after him the ulama that they have shown to us who qualify to be representatives of the Imams, the Mushtais, the Maraji' of Taqlid, may Allah protect them and give them long life. We follow their example and their guidance, especially in those cases where there's confusion, where there's contradiction, where there is ambiguity, we seek their guidance. Next, so let me pause here. Where there's ambiguity or there's confusion or there's differences of opinion or there's contradictions, we say, wait, we have to follow the topmost expert and see what he tells us. Today was Friday. يا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا نودي للصلاة من يوم الجمعة فسعوا إلى ذكر الله. To pray Salat al Jumu'ah is wajib and people come for prayers. No, I'm sorry. There's a difference of opinion. For those of us from the older generation. Marhum Ayatullah Gul Paigani's fatwa, if you recall, was that even if we prayed Salatul Jumu'ah, it would not substitute for Salatul Dhuhr. We had to pray Salatul Dhuhr. Qanini, Musawa, according to him, in the Ghaybat of Kubra, Salatul Jumu'ah is not wajib. Mustahab, yes, but not wajib. For those of us who are older, before him, Marhum Sayyid al Hakim, before him, Mahum said Burujati back in the 60s, their fatwa was no, it is not wajib, it's mustahab, and you pray the Jumu'ah if you want, but you must pray Dhuhr after that. But Mahum said, Khoi rahmatullah he said, no, it is wajib, takhiri. After that, briefly, we went to Sayyid Gul Paigani, Rahmatullah and then we came to Azdai Sistani, Hafizahullah, and they give the fatwa that it is wajib, takhiri. So you notice there's a difference of opinion. But wait a minute, I thought the ayah of the Quran says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Yes, Master, what do you want me to do? Ida nudiya lissalah. I remember in this very imam, a few decades ago, Marhum Sayyid Saeed Akhtar Razawi Sahib, Rahmatullah I don't know what was the occasion he was asked this question in the question answer session. He explained. But notice the ayah says, Ida nudiya. When the call is made, the adhan, when the conditions are fulfilled, that's when you go for Salat al Jumu'ah, not otherwise. So we say, oh, there are conditions to be fulfilled? Yes. Even the Sunni scholars say that the Imam of Jumu'ah has to be either the Prophet or somebody who succeeds the Prophet or the head of state appoints somebody. They say numbers are necessary. Some of the Muslim say that you need 40 people. So if there's a village, but there are less than 40 Mu'mini according to their fatwa, Salat al-Jumu'ah cannot be established. So there are conditions. Either no dia. When the nida is made correctly with all the conditions fulfilled. So amongst our fuqaha, they say based on the riwayat, we find that in the ghaybat of Kubra, some riwayat say, no, it is not wajib. Some say, yes, it is. So now we have conflicting reports. How do you reconcile? And therefore you have these two opinions. And then some have 
Fuqaha have looked this, at this ayah and have tried to analyze it. إِذَا نُوْدِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمُعَةِ فَاسْعَوْ Then you must rush and hasten. Do, does everybody has to hasten and rush? No. There are some who are exempted. Somebody who is sick, somebody who is elderly, it's, or it's raining, or women, or underage. All these things, all these details are mentioned in the riwayat. So you need to be an expert in the hadith to be able to extract these laws. فَسَعَوْ إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Rush to Salatul Jumu'ah for the dhikr. What of Salatul Jumu'ah is dhikr? Salatul Jumu'ah is replaced with Salatul Dhuhr of the Friday. It's got two parts. There's a khutbah, which has to be before the salah, and there's a turak as salah. Both of them have zikr, khutbah, or incidentally, what should the khutbah comprise of? The hadith will tell us what is the wajib ingredient or component of the khutbah. So khutbah is zikrillah, and I have to rush to zikrillah. But did you know the fatwa of the fuqaha is if you don't attend the khutbah, your salah is not bothered. You can still come and join Salat al Jumu'ah, and your Salat al Jumu'ah is valid. Oh, but I thought the uh, ayah says you must go to the khutbah, and now the fatwa is no. So there is a difference. It's not wajib in all circumstances. No, khut the dhikrullah to which you must rush and hasten is not the khutbah, it's the salah. Well, those fuqaha who argue that. Salah may not be wajib. They say, no, it's not wajib for you to attend Salah of Jumu'ah at the time when it begins. Allahu Akbar, and you have to be there. No, you can delay and postpone joining till the end uh, of the first rakah. In Rukur, you can join. No, you can join in the second rakah. But in second rakah, you must join before the Imam goes to Rukur. So they say, well, if it was wajib, then how come you're allowed to join much later on? ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ If you do this, it's good for you. Good? I thought it was wajib. The faqih says, you see? So there's evidence within the ayah which indicates, no, it is not wajib. But we have to look for secondary evidence. Again, there's a debate between fiqh at the ishtihadi level that, sorry, all these points that you have raised, they can be rebutted at the ishtihadi level. So if you're saying that, um, not attending the salah in the first raka'ah indicates therefore it's not wajib. No, not necessarily, because the khutbah, if you are saying that somebody can skip it and you are claiming as uh, at the ishtihadi level that there's ijma' of the fuqaha on this, sorry, we don't agree with this ijma. Again, what is ijma? What is, what is its validation? What are the factors that can weaken it or invalidate it? It's an ishtihadi discussion. You're saying that rush to dhikrullah and dhikrullah is salah and salah, not wajib to attend khaswaka, not wajib to attend even the second raka till before you go to ruku. Sorry, that does not negate the fact that salah can be wajib. And you're saying, oh, ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ This is good for you, not wajib for you. Sorry. In the Qur'an, khair is used both for mustahab and also khair is used for wajib. So this word itself in here cannot be used to say, no, it's not wajib. Or cannot be used to say, it is mustahab only. So for example, in the Qur'an about sadaqah, we have an ayah which says it is khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim In tubdu sadaqati fa ni'immahi If you go and give sadaqa out in public, that's very good. Others will see it. The poor will get encouraged that there are people out there to sponsor us. Wa in tukhfuha But if you do it khafi and hidden and privately, not in public, and you give it to the real needy, not the false beggar, not the lying beggar, not the professional beggar. Faqir who is really needy. You can go and work, you must go and work. You don't deserve to get the wajib charity. Into 
Definitely this is better. But why is it better? Must have to do sadaqah between public and private. Private is better. Kwanini private is better. Well, for you, ikhlas is better. Kwanini is better to do it in private. It, it protects the honor of the poor, the dignity of the poor. He didn't have to publicly come and ask. And he didn't have to be seen in public receiving it. So khair in the Quran, yes, is used to mean mustahab. But it can be wajib. There's an ayah in the Quran which if you recite wrongly, you're a kafir. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. But the ayah is from Surah Tawbah. So am I supposed to recite Bismillah? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وأذان الله is making azan وأذان من الله ورسوله this is a proclamation to everyone إلى الناس to all of the mankind at that time يوم الحج الأكبر on the day of Hajj Akbar. Hajj Akbar, you have Hajj Asghar, which is a smaller Hajj. You only go to Mecca and do Umrah. The Hajj Akbar is when you go outside Mecca in Ihram to Arafah, and from Arafah to Muzdalifah, and Muzdalifah to Mina, and then you come back to Mecca for the Umrah. Hajj Al Akbar, make the proclamation Allaha Bari'um Min Al Mushrikeen, and Allah has ordered the dissolution of all treaties that we made with the mushrikeen. They keep on breaking every pledge and promise we make. Now we are not going to respect it. We are breaking them. Bari anna allaha bari on min al mushrikeen. Allah has distanced himself now from the mushrikeen. Wa. Now this is the word which is kufr here. If I recite it wrongly. أن الله بريء من المشركين ورسوله أستغفر الله. Allah is distancing himself from the mushrik and from the prophet. No, it's God and the prophet who distance themselves from the mushrik. Not God distances himself from the mushrik and the prophet. أن الله بريء من المشركين ورسوله. Not رسوله. فَإِنْ تُبْتُمْ مُشْرِكْسِ But if you repent and you return and you revert, this فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ This is good for you. خير is mustahab here? No. If they don't do this mustahab, then إِنْ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ فَعْلَمُوا أَنَّكُمْ غَيْرُ مُعْجِزِ اللَّهِ وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ This is خير for you, mustahab? This is khair which is wajib. If you don't do this, there's adab alim. So there is a debate, fiqhi debate. Salatul Jum'ah wajib or not wajib? Can you use the word khair to prove it? No. There are counterpoints on that. Conclusion. There are several examples I can quote, but the point I'm trying to make is that in ijtihadi fiqhi matters, we need the expert to guide us because we need several preliminary studies to enable us to understand the deeper meaning. Um, so coming back to Surah Nuh, if I can give examples of how, so I, I'm not saying we go into deeper tafsir, but what I'm saying is that the Quran itself is inviting us. Do to the book. So I showed an example of how to do to the book in the first four verses. I'm showing another example of what the authors are suggesting for ayah number 5 to ayah number 7. 5 to 7. Yes. That, O oh Lord, I call them day and night. O oh Lord, this just made them even more resolute in their rejection. O oh Lord, when I call them, they put their hands and fingers in their ears. O oh Lord, when I call them, they covered their heads. O oh Lord, they just persisted in their defiance and they behaved with arrogance. As a matter of tadabbur, these authors are suggesting what we could take a lesson from this episode 
can apply to our lives is that notice Nuh salam is repeatedly, consistently, persistently, despite all the resistance, preach. My friend, O oh Prophet, why are you doing all this? You've seen them, they don't even want to listen to you, they're putting fingers in their ears. Dear Prophet, they are covering their heads, they don't want to listen to you, why are you persisting? The lesson to learn is, the results are in God's hands. I have a duty, my duty is Nuh. Inna arsalna Nuhan ila qawmihi an anzir. Your duty is to warn. Again, we had a doctor today. He came to warn us. Beware of the side effects of no screening and no detection and undetected damage that diabetes mellitus can ravage your body with. The duty is to warn. If they want to listen, good enough, they don't want to listen, I want to do my duty. So the authors are suggesting that we should try and realize that not always is the immediate results that should make us carry out our duty. Our duty is to be able to deliver whatever the circumstances. So. They quote an ayah from the Quran in Surah Mubarakim, Bani Israel, Woman Arad al Ahira, was Sa'alaha Sa'yaha. Surah Bani Israel, chapter 17, verse number 19. Whosoever wishes to gain salvation in the Akhirah, that is not going to be easy. Was Sa'alaha Sa'yaha. You need to work for it. You need to strive and struggle for it. And you have to be a believer. So that you just do good, but you're not a believer. Do good, and all that is necessary for building the Akhirah. Have belief. Definitely their efforts will be appreciated. So notice, this ayah is teaching us, do all your best to do whatever is your duty, even if no Nobody approves, appreciates, praises, commends, recommends. There's somebody who is going to appreciate you. Kana sa'yuhum mashkura. Beautiful lesson we learned from Nuh alayhi salam. Allow me to do a little reflection and then you can continue. So these verses are saying that Nuh alayhi salam preached day and night preached public and private, preached even to those who apparently weren't willing to listen. We're living in times where we are bombarded by the social media. The Quran says, beware, shaitan will come and attack you from your front, Surah Mubarak araf He'll come and attack you from your front, he'll come and attack you from your behind, from your right side, from your left side. There's an all-round attack. Nuh salam, teaches us how to have an all-round defense. So no problem if my access to the social media is now become 24-7, then the same social media, following the example of Nuh salam, can be 24-7 reply, protection, guiding, education, enlightenment. It's my decision how I decide to use or incidentally the fatwa. Is it allowed to use this phone and access social media or not? Answer. Same question was asked when the radio was made and the television and the internet. Is it allowed to use the radio or the gramophone or the TV or the internet? The answer is am I allowed to go to the market and buy a knife? It's a dual purpose device. You can use it to chop your meat and fruits, or you can use it, God forbid, to hurt somebody. It depends what use you make of it. All these devices are dual in purpose. It depends on your intention. Am I allowed to give it to my children? 
No, here is different. You must make sure that you take extra. These are fatwas. These are questions that were asked from the marja, and the answer was, you must make sure that they are protected from entering into websites or platforms or sources of information that could be harmful to them. So this is a beautiful lesson that we can learn from the example of Prophet Nuh Just a reflection and you can apply the same. Next, I number eight onwards. So I number eight, yes, I call them in public and I call them in private and I ask them to seek forgiveness. If you seek forgiveness, then you'll get all these benefits. Your life will be lengthened, your health will improve, your economy will be enhanced, all the positive benefits. But all of this depends on istighfar. The authors are suggesting one lesson we can learn and apply to our lives is to be regular and frequent and constant in our istighfar. So in the Quran, there is a special time daily to do istighfar. And that is the time of sahar, the pre-dawn. وَبِلْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ The true believers, pious, righteous, virtuous believers are those who, not only during the daytime they do their wajib prayers, but during the nighttime also they do their mustaha prayers, the salatul layl, the namaz al -shab, and they do istighfar. Or incidentally, the fatwa of Hazrat Ayyubah Sistani, Hafidhahullah, about, his, about namaz al -shab, is that that it has got a time of ada, it has got a time of falina, and it has got the best time, the afdal. The ada time of namaz al shab begins after Salat al isha before midnight. Around midnight is onwards is the time of falina for namaz al shab But the afdal time is closer to fajr, the sahab time. And during the Sahar time, these people do istighfar. So they say there are several times of the day of the year when istighfar is recommended. So if you allow me, I will add to the list. Okay, very good lesson we learned from Nuh Alayhi Do istighfar. Istighfar to do Mustab to do Shabbi Jumu'ah, Mustab to do in the months of Rajab, in the months of Sha'ban, in the month of Ramadan at the time of iftar, for example, on uh, Shabi Qadr, on Shabi Eid, on the day of uh, Eid. Or, another lesson that we could learn is, yes, istighfar is good, but istighfar itself has levels. There's a lower, medium, and high level. Minimum level is that I must have remorse in the heart, Mustahab to say is astaghfirullah, wajib to pay qaza, and also wajib to make the resolute determination not to repeat. Well, this is wajib, this is the minimum level of istighfar and tawbah. A higher level is no, I will not only repay back what is wajib, I'll pay back more. Highest level. All the fat that grew out of eating haram, I will melt it out. Uh, Dr. Sam, you talked about diabetes and obesity. One spiritual recommendation would be istighfar for diabetes. A higher level of istighfar, the way Amirul Mu'minin has mentioned, yeah, quoted in Najm Balawa, is the highest level of istighfar, that of illiyin, is that all the pleasures you derive from enjoying the haram act now punish the body. To unlearn the habitual addictive pleasure it had from listening to music, from watching something haram, from engaging in something haram, have an opposite program to teach your body pain and unlearn the pleasure. It's not wajib, 
It's not Bustan, it's a high level of istighfar. So notice, the Quran has got messages from the past that applies to our time also. Next, I number 13 onwards, yes. مَا لَكُمْ لَا تَرْجُونَ لِلَّهِ وَقَاهَا What is the problem? Why don't you respect the station of God? There is an interesting discussion here. I will, I will hold it later on. What I want to do is in the next verses, Allah then says, uh, sorry, Nuh salam says, you should learn to respect God because look at all his signs. And then he gives examples, the signs that you should look at. Look at how Allah has created you stage by stage. This was at the time of Noah. In our times, the embryologists have discovered details which are conforming to what the Quran says about the development of the human being. We created you stages by stages. We created the seven heavens, we created the sun, we created the moon. Yes, at the time of Nuh salam, mankind had basic knowledge about this creation. But as time progresses, there's more knowledge we get. So it's just an example. It's not only looking at the sun and the moon from the perspective of Nuh salam. Even from our time, so uh, just check what are the new discoveries that have been made about the sun and the moon. So I'll just share with you um, this interesting this uh, discovery. In 2023, this is just a few months ago, scientists confirmed the existence of new moons, uh, not the Earth moon, new moons for Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system, 12 new moons. So now the total count is 92 moons for Jupiter. And uh, Saturn, 2023, scientists have officially added 62 moons to the ringed Saturn's list. So now the total is 145 moons for Saturn. So if Saturn has five moons or 150 moons, Jupiter has 10 moons or 200 moons, what does it concern me? concerns you straight away. How so? Do you know how much you sweat during the month of Ramadan, during the daytime? What if I told you it's connected to the moons of Jupiter? Really? Yes. Because, remember, in the whole solar system, Jupiter is the largest planet. It exerts gravitational pull, even on the Earth. Should Jupiter change, the Earth's rotation around the Sun also will change. It will be yanked and pulled and have a longer rotation and hotter one. And then it will no longer be 40 degrees in fasting. It will go beyond. Nuh told them then, look at the Sun and the Moon. Quran is speaking today. Even today, there is a message for us. Finally, the ayah says that, why don't you respect God? Why don't you honor God, venerate God? Why don't you fear God? One of the most fundamental teachings of the Quran regarding a true believer is fear, but respectful fear reverential fear. إِنَّمَا تُنْذِرُوا مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الذِّكْرَى وَخَشْيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبَ You can only warn, O oh Prophet, in your time and in all times, those people who have awe and reverence for God, the God who is unseen, بِالْغَيْبِ The God who is present not only in public, if I don't say in public, even in private. The God who has promised me so much bliss, I haven't seen that bliss of Jannah. The God who has threatened me with so much punishment, 
del rei bi, I haven't seen it as yet. Yakhshawna rabbahum bil rei bi. All of that comes from Nuh alayhi salam's advice to his people. Look around and you see the signs of his majesty. After Nuh alayhi salam, Imam Zaman al-Jawad is also teaching us the same thing. In dua iftidah, Alhamdulillahi alladhi min khashyatihi tam'adu al-sama wa sukkanuha wa tarjufu al-ardu wa ummaruha wa tamuju al-biharu wa man yasbah fi khamaratiha There is khashya of the heavens and whoever is there in the heavens, the angels. وَهُمْ مِنْ خَشْيَتِهِ مُشْفِقُونَ So in Mubarak Anbiya. There is khashya in the earth. There is khashya in the oceans. Allah says that, do you know, if you look around in these mountains and hills, sometimes you find the pebbles and the rocks, they fall. وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَهْبِطْ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ These stones are falling under the fear of God. Believer, are you better or this stone who fears God? Let's pray to Allah for tawfiq to be able to learn lessons from our messengers, Prophet Muhammad and all the other messengers. And let our hearts get reformed and our society transformed. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.